Hey guys, and welcome to the third episode of the Devoured Apples podcast. Um, I have some fun goodies for you guys, and as promised, I have calculated the yardage before and after washing on all of my recent spins and the spins I completed last time. So, starting off with the um, with this piece that was Navajo applied. Before washing, I had um, 201 yards of this, and it was roughly 11 WPI wraps per inch. Um, after washing, it was 184 yards, and it actually went down to 10 WPI. I don't know if that's common, but this is a thick and thin, so that's an average. Um, it could be that some of my uh, thicker spots bloomed more, basically. That, that will happen as well. So for this one, I lost 17 yards total. And like I said, like it's, th this, these are like, um, I think 60 yard skeins, something like that, and they're pretty thick. Um, this one is a two ply, and it was 212 yards before washing, and it is now 199 yards. So I lost 13 yards, and this is the red, the, the black with red sparkle. It's really, really hard to see the sparkle right now for whatever reason. Let me turn my lamp on. Aha, you can see the sparkle a little bit better even though I look a bit more yellow. We'll, we'll play with the lighting here. Oh, you can see this one better too. I think I will leave that lamp on then. A little bit of mixture of natural daylight and artificial light here. So, and I did complete, oh my god, this monster. I say monster because it is huge. I left it skeined. And I just did like a very loose skeining on it, so there's my ends are just kind of floating around because I didn't secure them. This is super temporary. As soon as I finish filming this and take a picture for Instagram, of course, um, I'm balling it. So, but I decided to leave it in the skein so that you guys could see all of the mixture of color. So whenever I applied this, um, I applied from center ball to outer ball so that my colors would stay mixed because a lot of my early spins they would start off like the gloves I showed you guys in episode one they would start off in my two plies the colors being consistent and then they would just gradient and barber pull out the farther down the skein you got so in order to avoid that I just completely made sure that I did them opposites so mostly it is the gray green with black but there's still a lot of places where the Kelly green is with the gray green, a lot of gray green on top of each other, some some of the dark gray black areas on top of each other. So it looks like a fractal, but I didn't exactly fractal it. So it's a sort of fractal, I guess. So yeah, and I am just so proud of it. So this baby, this monster, um, is uh, was 479 yards before washing and it was 454 yards after washing so I lost 25 yards from this but we're also my yardage was in the 400s on this one and was in the 200s on like the early 200s on these ones so basically the rate at which my yardage shrinks is probably roughly the same across all my skeins so why is my yardage shrinking when I wash it? Because they're woolen spun. Woolen spun yarns are spun uh, long draw. And they're also spun from Rolag. So they're a lot closer to a true woolen than a semi-woolen or semi-worsted. Uh, they're, they're, they're closer to a true woolen. So whenever you short draw, you're like, okay, so a true woolen is long draw from a roll lag, which all of my yarns are. Worsted would be short draw from top, and that would be a true worsted. And semi woolen and semi worsted are like if you spin worsted from a roll lag, that would be semi worsted. If you spin long draw from top, that would be semi woolen. And the combinations just continue on. So a lot of people spin uh, semi yarn so it's either going to be semi woolen or semi worsted but 
like I said, mine mine is, is closer to a true woolen since I do prefer Rolex. So Whew, I hope all of that made sense. So yeah, worsted is a type of yarn and the way that the yarn is spun as well as being a weight of yarn. So you can have a fingering weight worsted spun because you're talking about the spun type. You're talking about the, the yarn type, not the yarn weight. So worsted is a weight, but it's also a, um, a type of yarn that if you spin short draw, it, it is worsted. And I'm just still showing this off because I'm like, it's fucking beautiful. So let me put this down because I'm just all over the place with it and show you the sample that I did. So this was a crepe yarn that I did. Uh, the very first crepe yarn I've ever done. And I really, really like how it turned out, but it's hard to tell it's a crepe because um, what I did was I two plied my, um, and, and I showed you guys uh, this, I think, did I show you guys this? I don't know. I don't know, man. Huh. Anyway, so this is basically, um, so I've, I've got, I got two samples out of this uh, spin. So I did a two ply fingering weight and then I cabled the leftovers because my crepe yarn was a slightly different shade of brown and you can see it really well on these right here that there are two shades of brown going on. I don't know if my camera auto focuses or not. That would suck. Uh, close ups will very well be on my Instagram, faux show. So you can definitely tell it's a crepe yarn here where um, my uh, where my crepe ply, that's what I'm gonna call it, the single ply that you ply with your two ply. Um, is very thick and thin but and it looked more thick and thin on my spindle than it actually was uh, so once I started plying it basically because my crepe yarn came out to roughly the same yardage as my two ply because I spun the crepe yarn thicker it's hard to tell it's a crepe yarn so if you like the structure that a crepe yarn will give you you can spin your crepe ply to the same way as your double ply and it won't quite look like a crepe yarn but it'll still act like a crepe yarn when you're knitting with it um but yeah there are lots of interesting blooms in this and i i will be posting to instagram on it because i think my camera might be shitty you guys um this cable ply this is my first cable ply and i have to say it look it looks pretty cool it looks pretty cool it's very um interesting and i love these colors together and i think if i ever make large batches of this to sell later i will definitely be calling it pharaoh because doesn't it look like i think it's king tut it could be someone else but those those um the tops of their sarcophagi um look like this, it's got the blue on top of the gold, right? So it just makes me think of pharaohs, I don't know. And like my brown that I really like, my brown heather, uh, I really liked it and I was like, oh my God, Cleopatra. Like, oh, I just, I wanna name this one Cleopatra. So I think I might have a thing for that. I know that as a kid, I wanted to be an archeologist really, really bad and I was all into Egypt and, that was back whenever the History Channel actually showed history shit and not weird ancient aliens and pawn stars and the, the pickers, American pickers or whatever. All that stuff is fucking crap. Their documentaries on ancient Egypt were like my jam as a kid. So, a little bit about me. Um, those are all of my spins. So, my next spin is actually going to be... A different kind of crepe yarn. I am going to do another self striping, another self striping, um, but I am actually going to Navajo ply. So it will be a crepe with a Navajo ply instead of a two ply, and then my crepe yarn. And I want to make my crepe yarn 
Hold on a moment. That is actually really hilarious. That was Paradise Fibers calling me back. So, I did finally get my Corydale Cross in the mail today because I did do a little vlog video that I think I titled it Vlog Experiment or something like that and I was talking about how Paradise Fibers sent me a pound of Cheviot instead of a pound of Corydale. And then they ran out of Corydale. So I had to wait. I ordered this in early February. It is now late March. And I finally got my Corydale Cross today. So that was super awesome. However, they were supposed to send me a packing slip that I could put on the box and then put the Cheviot in. So I called them and I was like, Hey guys, like, y'all didn't give me a packing slip for the Cheviot, so I don't know how I'm going to give that back to you guys. The lady was like, how would you feel if we said just keep it with our compliments? So they're letting me keep the Cheviot, which is cool. So because they also, I ended up calling them a lot to figure stuff out because there was definitely a lot of miscommunication going on between their shipment. Um section, their shipment people, and their customer service people, and so I was calling back and forth a lot. I'm on a first name basis with everyone at Paradise Fibers, now, which is so funny. So about a week and a half ago, maybe two weeks ago, they gave me a thousand Paradise points, which is basically a ten dollar off coupon whenever you go to cash in your points. So they gave me a ten dollar off coupon for being late already and they let me keep the Chevy out? I'm like okay paradise this is kind of nice <laughs> like I don't like it like when companies fuck up but it's inevitable that slip-ups are gonna happen mistakes are gonna be made and it's all about how it's all about how someone and and their company uh, solves those problems and they kind of went overboard, I think, by letting me keep the Chevy out, but I'm definitely not complaining. I am very happy that I get to keep the Chevy out, and oh my gosh, I'm just, I have a pound of this to play with now, because I know that Chevy out and nylon will make a really sturdy, hard-wearing sock, so I'm really happy about this, and I know that Corydale will make really good socks that are hard-wearing, but very soft, but this one's going to be like super hard-wearing if I do socks with it, but also, I, like I've said, and I've said this before, I think, you're slightly coarser because it's wool it's not exactly going to be coarse coarse we're not talking about carpet yarn here or carpet wool as it's often called this is still very next to skin wool so whenever i say coarse i don't mean coarse coarse i mean middle of the range ish kind of coarse so these crimpier coarser wools will spin very very fine very easily and it's easier to spin it more consistently because the crimps kind of help you spin it more consistently. So, I don't know. That was kind of awesome. I was really hoping that I would hear from them because I wanted to give you guys an update uh, on my Paradise Fiber debacle that actually, like, turned out really great for me, I guess. <laughs> um, yeah. Paradise Fibers is pretty damn great. So, and like I've said, I've been ordering from them since 2016 and I've never had any problems. This is the first time I've had a problem. And like I said, they've gone above and beyond to compensate me. And I was saying like, oh man, this is going to be really bad to send this back because the closest UPS store to me uh, is a mile and a quarter bike right away. So I don't have to get on my bike and ride a mile and a quarter away because I get to keep it. So. It's pretty fucking awesome and I can't wait to start playing with that stuff because and I haven't been touching the Chevy out. I haven't touched the Chevy out. this has been in my closet well away from my cat well away from anything because I didn't want to damage it because I was like this needs to be sent back this should be sent back so that they can sell it to someone else and I don't want to ruin their merchandise so I actually get to play with it now so that's really awesome and now I have my Corydale to play with so as you can see, I'm very ecstatic about that. So, woosah, calm myself down a little bit. Um, 
because there is a book I want to show you guys. So I didn't actually put it next to my desk, so I'm going to have to pause this again. But before I show you the book, I don't know if you guys can hear the construction work going on. That is my bedroom window. There is a yard behind my bedroom window, and that is where they are all at. They grind all day, like sawing, grinding, everything, laughing obnoxiously, singing obnoxiously, cussing at each other all the time. Honestly, Saturday, I think it was, I thought two of them were going to come to blows. I was at my window with my blinds down like, ooh. Um, I didn't get to watch a fight because the foreman or whoever was in charge, you could definitely tell he was in charge. He was the man with the fuzzy balls. And he came over and broke it up and sent one, sent one of the guys home off site. Um, and I was like, damn it. I wanted to watch some big sweaty construction workers fight, man. And they're super fucking annoying. I cannot stand them. And... I, I, I like eye candy just as much as the next person, so a bunch of sweaty, bulky, you know, muscular men outside my bedroom window, you think that that would be a fucking dream? But they are so loud. They are even here on Sundays. So I can't sleep in. They always wake me up, and they're here from dusk till dawn. So if I want any kind of natural light like this, um, until they're done... There's going to be a lot of that horrible background noise, and I am so fucking sorry, because <laughs> it's horrible, it's horrible, and I really wanted to film outside on my balcony, but that's not possible at all, because it's even louder. I have all my windows closed, and my door closed, and it's still this loud, if you can hear it, so... Hey guys, so the book, as promised, is the Spinner's Book of Yarn Designs. And as you can see, there's not a lot of color work in here, and I like that because she decided to focus more on the plying and the types of yarn and all of that stuff as opposed to trying to do an all-in-one book, which I feel like a lot of the books I've read have tried to be all-in-one books and they end up just all being the same, and I'll talk more about those uh, in the next episode. I like that she decided to focus on mainly one thing and do that one thing to the fullest extent, which is types of yarn and ways to ply. And she has everything in here. She even talks about which... Okay, so at the beginning, it's not just all plying. She does talk about um, how to start off spinning, so it's very beginner friendly. Um, she talks like... She basically runs through the nuances as well of twist amounts and um, how you know that you have enough twists. She goes through wraps per inch. And honestly, <clears throat> she has inspired me to get a round wrap per inch measure because I've never invested in a wraps per inch measure. I've just always used a ruler. But if you use a round one and you roll it, it's a lot better than if you just take a... a ruler and you wrap it like this, you're introducing twist into an or into or out of your yarn when you're twisting it like this. But if you've got a round one and you roll it, you're not introducing any extra twist. You get a more accurate wraps per inch. So I definitely want to find a little tool like what she's got. I want what she has. Anyway, she talks about fleece. Um, you know, and um how to know if you've got a good fleece or not and whether you'd want to buy that fleece or not, uh, which is super awesome. She even talks about um, how some types of wools can feel prickly to people with sensitive skin and which types of wool will not feel prickly, even if you've got someone who's like a little princess who feels the prickle particularly hard. So... She talks about washing fleece, and she goes through the differences between woolen and worsted. I feel like that is a staple among any book on spinning. There's always going to be a section telling you about the difference between worsted and woolen. So, how to use hand carters, all that stuff. Punies versus Rolex versus uh, roving versus top, drum carter. She even has a really good drum carter section, which I found more helpful than in any of the other all-in-one books that try to do everything in one go. And she did it all in, what, two pages? Two pages front and back? So, uh, boop, boop, boop. 
she talks about spinning singles, the different singles that are basically going to um, come back later in your plying. So like a thick and thin single you will use to make a thick and thin spiral or beehives. So just as an example. She talks about also there are different rope techniques like whenever you are twisting rope you can apply those to spinning and that's really cool and they are very tried and true methods so there are some plies and some of these 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 methods especially the hawser ply that will uh, make an extremely elastic yarn so it's not just oh here's a yarn that looks really pretty it's do you want an extremely elastic yarn here's how you do it um all kinds of good stuff um, she even talks about opposing plies, which I've always been taught. You, you ply all S's into Z's and all Z's into S's. Her opposing plies, you will have one ply, like you'll have all Z's and one ply S, or all S and one ply Z, and you ply all of those together. And it makes an extremely, uh, sturdy, hard-wearing sock. So, another thing that she does in here, speaking of socks, because she does this um, very, very well. Let me see where that could possibly be. All the flipping. She does the great sock yarn experiments. So she will make, so, so like what she did specifically, and like she does this throughout the book with different ones. Um, she'll do one sock Navajo ply or chain ply, whichever one you want to call it. They're the same thing. She'll do one chain ply yarn, one traditional three ply yarn, and wear the socks. She'll make a sock with one and a sock with the other. So one sock is Navajo plied, one sock is um, traditional three ply. She will wear them and tell you what the results were. So a lot of people say that Navajo ply is not as structurally sound as traditional three ply. What she found was that the stitches fail at the same time, but the Navajo ply the, the holes are bigger, which if they fail at the same time, what does it matter if the holes are bigger or smaller? I mean, yeah, it makes the mending process easier, but if you're like me and you're very hyper vigilant of your handmade socks, you will definitely be checking them between washes to make sure. So I feel like for me, yeah, I would definitely do a chain ply sock yarn and feel totally comfortable about it and have no remorse of having done a chain ply instead of a traditional three ply. That's if I want to keep the colors consistent because otherwise there is no need to do all that work. So yeah, she has literally everything and she even has a great sock yarn experiment um, with the uh, opposing ply yarn versus a traditional three ply. So she's got an opposing ply, three ply, and a traditional three ply. I'm not going to reveal the results of that experiment, but it's pretty cool. And um, her bouclés, her bouclé section is highly extensive. So years back, I thought I did a bouclé, but what I really did was a spiral yarn. Because of this book, I know that now. I know that that was not a bouclé, that was a spiral yarn. And I was very silly for thinking I had done a bouclé when I had done a spiral. But uh, at that point, I'd only been spinning for a little over a year, so not bad, but still funny and uh, I haven't really gotten into art yarns because art yarns can be quite difficult on a spindle quite difficult and I mentioned that at the end of the last episode so um, really I'm gonna wait until I get my um, wheel and I'm gonna start playing with these art yarns and stuff so because you can do art yarns on a spindle you most definitely can um, I feel like it's a lot of trouble when I don't use art yarns. I would pretty much be making art yarns to sell. Because I just don't knit with art yarns. I really like the consistent yarns. I like I like color work yarns a lot. But art yarns are extremely beautiful. They are very beautiful. And now that I'm weaving, I feel like I would get more use out of some art yarns now. But back then, I was like, no more. No more art yarns on a spindle. And I still feel that way. Um, 
she talks a lot about beaded yarns and there are so 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 many different beaded variations to her yarn so she'll show you a yarn and then she'll show you a beaded variation of that same yarn not for every different type of yarn but for a lot of them that are very good for beading she'll do that and on the cover here I'm not giving anything away if it's on the cover <laughs> so that is a peacock bead she's got two greens and one pink it is a peacock beaded section on this uh, coiled yarn she shows you how to do it she shows you also how to combine spindles with wheels when you're doing uh, particularly com complicated art yarns and I don't want to give that away either because it's so oh my gosh it's so ingenious this woman is so ingenious um, you can definitely tell that I really, really love this book. I will probably go out and buy this book because like I said, right now it's a library book. I've got to give it back at some point. I've got to give it back. So I think the longest you can have a book is like a month and a half. So yeah. And when I have enough money too, I will be buying this book. At the back of the book, she has this section with these cards so if you're making a specific yarn and she's got all of all the yarn she talks about because these are front and back she's got a card for it so you don't have to break out this big old book if you're working on a certain yarn you can take out the card and refer to these pictures anytime you get confused on it so I think that's pretty amazing right like what and I really like what this book has going on guys like and all of like, like her she does the core spuns she has tons of tips for perfecting a core spun because core spuns I've heard can be quite difficult um, to master for some people um, she even talks about coreless core spinning um, her novelty yarn section is also pretty um, extensive her glossary is the longest glossary I have seen in any book. It is four pages. Right, left, right, left. She even talks about xanthan gum in her glossary, which is like, I use that for cooking. I'm on a gluten-free diet. I'm completely gluten intolerant. It will make me sick. So I use a lot of xanthan gum in the kitchen. Well, she's telling you how you can use it as a super starch whenever you are, um, because if you're using a energized single, which has a lot of twist in it, and you're using it for a design element, and when you're knitting with it, you don't want it to be super energized. You want to block that yarn to where it looks like it's not energized. Um, how you can do that and make it as sturdy as possible is to use xanthan gum as a starch, as like a super starch. So you can starch block your energized single that way and then whenever you wash that starch out it'll do this do the energized single thing where it all curls up and yeah I think that's really cool so yeah anyway her glossary pretty much has everything um, most of the glossaries I've seen in books are a page two pages They've only got between 10 and 15 definitions. And even then their definitions are like a sentence long. And you saw her definitions are quite extensive. Uh, there are only a few that are one sentence. Most of them are multiple sentences. So she really, really explains things well in her glossary. So if you come across a word while you're reading, there's a glossary in the back, you guys. Check it out. Um, it's good stuff, good stuff. So that was the book, again, the Spinner's Book of Yarn Designs by Sarah Anderson. Thank you, Sarah Anderson. This is a great book. And I can't believe it was in my library. Awesome. So what I've been working on this week, I can't show you my knitting. You've already seen my spinning. But I will do kind of this. I didn't make it this week. I made it forever ago. But it's a great spring or summer pattern. I don't know where to find this pattern. It was actually an image. It was an image of a printout of a chart. 
floating around on the internet. Um, but it's crocheted, and it makes a great, a great cow, especially for this time of year where it's hot enough to need a ponytail, but you still get that gust of cold wind that like hits the back of your neck, and you're like, oh, cold, it's cold, it's cold. So. This keeps the shivers off the back of my neck while not being hot at all. Um, I think this is a wool cotton blend. I do believe it's a wool cotton blend right here. And um, yeah, fairly pretty. Um, can't show you my knitting still. It's all baby stuff. So <laughs> all baby stuff that I can't spoil anything with. But I have been doing calligraphy extensively, more so than usual. You guys, my sister's wedding. I'm doing her invitations in calligraphy. And I just want to show you guys, this invitation has a lot of uh, specific information on it, so I'm not going to show you, like, I'm not going to show it for a long period of time, but I am going to show it because it is very, very pretty in the font. And this is just a basic Spencerian font, so um, turned out extremely well. This silver ink, though, was not my go-to ink for this project. I found this beautiful moss green color, and this is the color my sister's going for for her wedding. And it was just so gorgeous, and I was like, oh my god, this will be perfect for the invitations. The paper on on this had other plans though. It very much muted the green and uh, mattified the metallic of it. So, and it was hard to read as well. So, that was a bummer. However, I tried out all of my inks on it, and I sent my picture. I sent my sister pictures of of a swatch of all the different inks on the paper. She really liked the silver. I actually had to go out and get a better silver because the silver I had uh, was very runny. And you'll get this, you know, like inks, depending on the brand, will either be more on the runny end of the spectrum or more on the very thick end of the spectrum. Your thicker inks are going to gob worse, but I found that with metallics, you want a thicker ink. Now, Liquitex is a brand that is very, very thick, and I don't like it. It gobs too much. Peach Martins was a happy... Thick enough without gobbing too quickly, but even so, I have found that in mass producing these, I have two nibs of the same exact type and I alternate between them. So I'll do an invitation, throw a nib in the ammonia, pull the other nib out, clean it, slap it in, keep going. So I alternate between nibs as I'm working. Um, the paper is very slick, which is why I can't have a thin ink on it because it will just. Um, gob on the paper instead of it being too thick and it gobbing on the nib. We'll gob on the paper. And where are my nibs? Anyway, I don't know where they are. They're somewhere. Where are they? What the hell? Where did they go? Oh, I ain't liking this. Oh gosh, there they are. Fuck. I'm so silly. They were underneath my paper. That was all my bad. That was all me. That wasn't even my cat. That was all me. Okay. So because the paper is so slick, um, I've actually been able to use the Browse Rose, which I don't get to use very often. I've been mainly using my Browse Pumpkin for things, but this paper, it's so smooth. This is like the silkiest paper I've ever worked on, this right here, that my Browse Rose works perfect without snagging any of the paper because the paper is like pretty much unsnaggable. So these are the two nibs I've been alternating between. They're both Browse Rose and they are amazing. And I love them, they're my favorites. Um, I've not ever been able to use these before on any other paper. These are like, you need to be pretty good with your pin angle, very comfortable calligrapher, not expert but comfortable calligrapher to use those, I would say. And they make really, really beautiful, and if I just show you, especially look at the S in Sarah, and the curl of the H. 
it's very, very thin, but then you can get really thick with it too. So it makes that beautiful, beautiful, super thin line, super thick downstroke, super thin upstroke, super thin downstroke, thick downstroke. Oops. I get very excited. So my sister sent me one of the um, overlays. So the invitation is going to go in here and like you can definitely tell like my sister has a flair for style and it looks fantastic inside. I decided to color it though because I did not want my moss green to go to waste and I figured she would love to keep this one as, as her copy because she wants to keep a copy of the invitation obviously. Um, so this is her copy and I colored the leaves and the flowers and the grass and I did all of this while I was on the phone with her actually because we were on the phone for quite a long time. Hi Sarah, thanks. <laughs> Love talking to you. Um, yeah, so that has been a really fun project I've been uh, working on. That is not what I usually do. So. I love calligraphy, but I don't often get an opportunity to do it. And Brad is going to say hello here at the end of the podcast. Hold on. Is he gone yet? No. No. He likes to walk across my desk uh, to remind me that he's here, I guess. Because there was absolutely no reason to walk across my desk to get to his water bowl. He could have jumped down and walked, but he's going to walk across my desk, so. Hey guys, I'm coming at you today. Um, I finished filming the podcast and then I got my darn good yarn box. So I was like, let me squeeze this in real fast. And I think I found a lull in the uh, construction workers schedule, hopefully. Um, they just got into a huge fight and they almost came to blows. It was so fucking funny. But um, anyway, like again, it happened again, like just now. I yelled out uh, my window at him. I was like, damn, y'all, I need to get me some popcorn up here. And they were like, oh my god, they were so embarrassed, which they should be. A grown-ass man shouldn't be fighting like that. So, this is the yarn they sent me. Not super happy with it. I don't know what I'm going to do with it. Um, I may or may not use it in warp for something like really crazy, colorful kind of thing. I've really been thinking about weaving a diaper change mat for my sister. And my first weave is what I want to do that with. I'll show it to you guys real fast. So this is my first weaving piece. I was really overzealous. I made a big, big weaving piece. And I was thinking that this would be great for a diaper change pad. You know, like whenever you're out in public, you don't have to put your baby's bum on some dirty public restroom diaper changing table. So, however, there are spots where I could give this to her easily, but you can see at the top, this is my first weaving and it's kind of um, irregular in places. So if I could redo this differently and better, I will. And I'm honestly thinking this is a 50 gram ball. The other ball was a 50 gram ball. I could do something like that with this and it wouldn't be, it wouldn't be as finely woven as this is but it will still be um, very nice. It'll still be really nice. So that's what I am thinking about doing. And I would use this as the warp and the other one as the weft since the other one is a single. And I think they would come out really, really funky, you know, which would hide any stains as well. And since this already has some dingy color change, I think it would be perfect for that. And it would be super durable too, because this is recycled silk. That might be what I do with that. They also sent me some darn good yarn bling, which I'm glad because if it had just been this, I would have been a little salty, I think, but this is so cute. This is a needle and hook case. I'm not going to use it for that though. I'm going to use it as a tiny project bag of some kind, and uh, especially for the baby socks whenever I do the baby socks out of my mini skeins that I have left over. And it's great. This is actually made out of canvas and not silk, which is a first. Um, I like that it's made out of canvas. I don't have to worry about my needles or hooks poking through the silk and gnarling the nice silk fabric. So that's really cool. Um, yeah, pretty awesome. One more thing before I let you guys go. My Ravelry is finally updated. 
I have never been active on the Ravelry forums. I used to be active as far as my projects went, but I've really just been using it to track my stash and as a pattern database, and that's it. So I finally put my hand spuns up there because I didn't do that before. So I finally have my hand spuns up there. I have all the specs for them up there, and uh, I can actually, whenever I search for patterns now and I look through my stash, I can actually see my hand spuns in my stash, which is convenient for me, but it's also nice for you guys because my first few skeins, which do not exist anymore, <laughs> I believe I might have thrown them away or donated them. Um, you can actually go on there and see some of my very first skeins. And I'm thinking I will pop them up here for you. You can see, like, um, they're not very impressive at all. They're actually really badly spun. And they're super, super bulky. But that's what your first skeins are going to look like. And I feel like I'm always showing you guys these awesome, beautiful skeins and, and just wonderful, like, hand-spun art yarn and beautiful stuff. And... We all start somewhere, and I just kind of wanted to show you guys that. So, yay! And I will try to be better about being active on my Ravelry and uh, maybe getting on some of the forums, especially some of the spinning forums. Um, I have made an effort since November or December to be more active on my Instagram. So, I have been doing that a lot. Whereas before, I think like my first 25 to 50 posts spanned years <laughs> and I only did like 50 posts in like five years three years something like that and um, much better about it now much better at posting stuff now so there is that and I've also been on the um, knitting subreddit subreddit um, I haven't had a reddit account for very long <laughs> But what I really like about the knitting subreddit is that they actually have a Discord where you can all communicate with each other via Discord. And it doesn't have to be voice chat. Like, I haven't actually communicated with anyone via voice chat on Discord. Um, just talking and IMing. And it is great. They have a channel for everything. And when I showed up, they actually created a uh, yarn spinning um, kind of like channel. And I thought that that was a really, really wonderful welcome. They're very, very welcoming over there. Um, they have the knitting. They have um, knit along channels. They have knit along channels for all kinds of different things, for knitting and crochet. So definitely check it out. That thing is awesome. And I've, I've been pretty active on there just because it's so friendly. It's a wonderful community. Um, but I'm, like I said, I'm going to try and get on some... Um, some Ravelry forums for spinning. So maybe you'll see me on there, maybe you won't. We'll see, we'll see. So now this is the end of the podcast and I hope that you guys have a uh, wonderful spinning journey and that if you make any mistakes, you don't have to rip back too far. Bye-bye. <laughs>